Simon, you are yourself a kind of one-man music drama, <laughs> being a, a sort of multiple I, I instrumentalist and an actor. Indeed, I have done your research. Yeah, I am a sort of... I like to say Renaissance man, but it's just so not true. So I can't get neither cook, nor fight, nor write poetry. But I am a bit of a sort of music strange creature... Slash actor. How many instruments do you play? I think I play eight or nine. Wow. But not all fabulously. I know my way around them pretty well, and I teach two of them, the saxophone and the clarinet. The relationship between words and music is yes. something that is a good fit for you. And This project good. is a peach of a project. Uh, if I count myself as a composer who talks actor for this project, I'm not obviously in it, this is a great project for any composer, or any artist, actually. It's a very collaborative the project. But the words thing, yeah, I don't write very good lyrics. I didn't have to on this occasion, because Simon mm. Stevens wrote the verse. And then you have Bizet Score sitting there, which is also quite good. <laughs> quite good. <laughs> quite yeah, good. The premise of it interests me a lot, mm. because one of the starting points, and I completely identify mm. with this, is the idea, and I've spoken to many opera singers in my yeah, time, yeah. of being an itinerant traveller, yes, taking roles to all kinds of places yeah. where one rehearsal room and one theatre is yeah. much the same as another. And yeah. suddenly, real life becomes indistinguishable yes. from the role you're playing in a That's weird... Right. I think it's a great idea. It is a great it. idea. And apparently, Victoria Vision, who is our opera singer and indeed has played Carmen in 40 different productions at least before the hundred times and she will often say if she was here now she'd say this is my life this is my life as actors or composers you know we have a rehearsal period of three four weeks and she would have had done that before but you know she drops in in various cities off the plane to the hotel maybe a little sleep off the rehearsal maybe perform that night it's very sort of set what she's going to have to do so you don't really see the city or the world around it. Well, most singers say that when they retire, they yeah. go back to the cities to actually see, Have a look. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what's going on in the city. But there's also this idea of Victoria Vision is Carmen, you know, that old yeah. marketing trick yes, that they it, do. When Michael Long has the direction, I, we were discussing, well, basically how to do it, I suppose it's the only way, fair way of saying it. Sharon Small plays the singer, the actor acts the singer, and then we have this, these choruses are written, and where are we going to have local people singing, 30 people singing whatever I wrote, mm. or were we going to have an actress who was also a very good at opera, <laughs> unlikely combination, or were we going to have an opera singer singing, and so we've ended up with Victoria singing the choruses and being the psyche of Carmen who wanders around the city out of Sharon's hair. She's brought a huge amount to the production, she's been a great help to me because she knows the score inside out and back to front. If we say, can we have a bit of that? She'll, she'll warble off some, you know, recitative from the Bizet, yeah, yeah. Presumably Simon Stevens chose Carmen because the story is very universal, the piece yeah. is very iconic. Yes. And the music true. is in the air. I mean, it is everybody in knows yeah. those tunes. They, they do. And I suppose I haven't, as an actor or composer, you know, opera's not my world, really. I, I do love classical music. And I, you know, I write film music and I write theatre music, whatever that creature is, like a hybrid creature. But opera is so opera, isn't it? There's a wonderful line Simon's put in that John Light says, when you hear the, the Toreador song chirp up near the end, he said, the character says, I know this music. I've heard this music every time I've been waiting to buy tickets on the ticket line or waiting to buy an air, air ticket. Of course, we've heard da, 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 a thousand times. It's one of those exactly. great populist pieces, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> I would describe this piece as a kind of psychedelic Carmen Jones, you know, uh, yeah, Carmen yeah. reinvented, yeah. but in a kind of surreal way, because yeah. it is written in blank verse, it, it, is, yeah. saying it has yeah. a heightened quality, it's very really? dense. Yeah. Was any of the music written into the fabric of the play? Or? No, no. Well, it had been done in Germany, in Hamburg, and I think they did it completely differently. The Simon script is just a very bald script, I think there's no stage directions or anything. The five monologues, and then Every now and again it would say chorus, and then his blank verse. And then there was nothing about music, and I was, it was, really was a blank canvas that mixed my metaphors. But it, and Michael Longhurst said, you know, how are we going to do this? What is this? So, well, I, I went through various machinations of what this could be, and eventually I was doing a job in Canada, performing in Calgary, and I just sat down with the Bizet score and, and looked at it and thought, how on earth can I fit these words to Bizet? And, of course, they don't fit to Bizet. In fact, Simon has written them... I think it's eight and nine stresses every line, which actually is the rhythm of the Habaneros, which is the famous tune, the very sexy and wonderful tune. 
But I thought, I can't set everything to that because it's just sort of boring. So I sort of had to rewrite stuff and, and steal stuff and make it fit. And it's really hard because they don't actually rhyme. I mean, this weird, typical Simon Stevens, very urban, what's that camcorder or receipts? To get those into a 19th century <laughs> opera rhythm is absolutely. <laughs> so I just sat for hours in my hotel room trying to work it out and sitting and plonking it out, yeah. But that's what's so freaky because you're sitting there yeah. and you this, this tune wafts in that you know yeah, so yeah, well. That's right. And the words are kind of. You know, it's like a hallucination. It is most peculiar, isn't it? And I don't quite know how it fits in with... You know, I was joking with Michael and so that we're sort of we're sort of inventing a slightly new form. It's not a new form, but it's, it's, it's a weird combination of these fantastic tunes. And then Simon's words are sort of heightened by this thing. Under, and also I've changed the tempos, I've changed the keys, I've written bits in them, I've moved them around. So I've, you've deconstructed. I've deconstructed, that's the word we like to use in deconstruct. Yeah. You re-listen, and it becomes sort of a slight, it's not trippy, isn't the right word, but it's sort of most peculiar and rather moving, actually, because it's like a sort of time warp between the 19th century and those tunes we sort of know through maybe school, and then these sort of rather urban images, like YouTube is mentioned in one of the lyrics. So I sat down and did it all, and sort of sang them to Michael in my house by the river, the piano, and it seemed to sort of really come alive, it was bizarre. <laughs> And Carmen is a male in this. And Carmen is a red drama. boy. He's this, a red boy. He's messed with everything. Carmen, as you know, has been worked and reworked. Mm. I'm not an opera person. I'm a swing jazz fan and love film music and uh, choral music. You think, what is this world of these people? But actually, when you get into it and see the iconic, well, the sexuality, the power, it's incredibly intoxicating, actually. And I can't believe I'm sort of saying that, but it's... It's really it's it, it's it's a folk tale in a funny sort of way. Isn't well, because it? because it is so universal, this yeah, folk tale, yeah, yeah. you can pull it any which pull way. It any which way, yeah. It. And we, and he certainly has done because they everything's turned on its head. Like Don Jose, who's the sort of lover soldier in Carmen, as you know, is in fact a female taxi driver, yeah. which is <laughs> sounds it, weird. It yeah. does wrong foot you, even yeah. people like me who know the opera yeah. pretty well. Yeah, sure. Let us into some of the conversations you and the director, yeah. Michael Longhurst, had about the sounds you were creating, the, sound. the instruments you would use, yeah. because that's your big first choice. That was the big it? first choice. And we were Skyping, he was in New York, and mm. I was in Canada. And, and I really liked the idea of this job, and you know, he hadn't really offered me the job, he sort of talked to me about it. And so then I came up with an idea of maybe, you know, there was, there was budget to be considered, but we didn't really consider budget to further down the road. You know, were we going to have a community choir? No, not really. Had, not sh- not sure we could do that. Too many people. How do we rehearse them? But I said, "What well, string quartet playing them?" Oh, that was quite interesting. And maybe we have two singers: a man singer and a male singer, who could sing these choruses I was going to write with Bizet's tunes. I'm not sure. There were, there were meetings here. Okay, maybe two instruments. I originally said, "Okay." I would uh, support it with sound. Kaz Down is the sound designer. She's put a lot of stuff in there too, but there is also music of mine on the soundtrack. We could have, I said, a cello and a saxophone rather curiously. I played the saxophone, so I didn't know how that instrument works. You know, Bizet was one of the first classical composers to use the saxophone in the orchestra, and that's the end and those things. It was at that time it was invented, and the, the devil's instrument was allowed in the orchestra for certain pieces. There's a little nod to, do, to Bizet, but actually... As we know, once you've got our opera singer, then it, it's too close to the opera singer. The, vo- the, the voice of the saxophone is too close mm-hmm. to her, mm-hmm. it would conflict. So I, I, then we got down to two cellos. And then we got down to where we're going to use musicians, or where we're going to have actor musicians. I've worked with actor musicians a lot, and musicians. And then we came to the conclusion we had two cellos as actor musicians because they were going to be present, very present on stage. And with due respect to other musicians, they aren't necessarily comfortable sitting on stage being part of the world we were creating. And so they were, they were like our little mini opera orchestra, really. So I had these lovely cellos, which obviously the, the frequency of the cellos sits below Victoria's voice. 
And then the, the, they're great players. We, we auditioned them, and, and I've worked with Harry Napier before, and Jamie Cameron we knew of, and we, they auditioned them. They, and they're great improvisers, and we did a lot of sitting in the rehearsal room making a racket, actually. They have pedals, what are called loop pedals, which is quite a sort of contemporary thing. So, you know, you, you play a bit and then press the record, and so that they build up levels oh, okay. of sound, which is yeah. really exciting. Mm-hmm. And, and, and also then Jamie had, you know... There's a, there's a couple of a Croatian fellas called Two Celles, who are wild and brilliant Croatian lads. They're all on YouTube. Very handsome, electric cellos, sort of like skeleton cellos, playing U2 and, and, and sort of rock stuff. There was something really anarchic about them, as well as beautiful, as well as anarchic. And I tend to steer towards the beautiful. Michael pushes me towards the anarchic, I think. So with our pedals, and then Jamie's electric for cello, he plays electric cello, which is basically sort of stick with strings on and plug it into an amp. We improvise lots of strange stuff through the text underscoring. So our two cellos seem to be quite a big hit, really. Good choice, Tick, mm. I felt. Because mm. mm. it, it covered our opera world and it covered our urban... You know, you, when you play the electric cello, it does sound a bit like an electric guitar. You can get some quite chunky chords on it. I've got a feeling that the fate motif in Carmen is played in the cello. It is. It, right, the very first thing you hear, the death... Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Da, and, and I've made them play it in sequence, so it's all slightly out, it's like phased. So, yeah. And it's such a magnificent, mm. gothic, dark, heart-rending, wonderful tune. And the cello is magnificent for that. But if you put them two together, and one is slightly behind the other, so you get the sort of phased effect, it suddenly gets slightly sort of weird and, and disturbing. <laughs> Puts you. Yeah. This is the experience, but it's also a live experience, which is really yeah. critical here as someone who writes yeah. music for film and TV. Yeah. Isn't Unbelievable, it? isn't it? And it's brave. I think it's quite brave. It's brave of them. It's brave of us because there's only three houses in the country in theatre. I don't mean opera or the West End, but you know, for plays, the National Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Globe have real musicians. And so to have live in this sort of theatre, in this sort of writing, is fantastic treat, really. And we have surrounded it and it is amplified and the lab that people got the microphones on. But it's still live and they're still, you know, looping live. It's not sort of pre-recorded, which is really exciting. Whatever style of music is required, mm. your your game by the sound Absolutely of it. Absolutely, game. Honestly, um, I don't know how to do it, but yeah. Is this as far out as you've pushed it? Do you reckon? I think it is. But the thing about my job as a composer in the theatre, you you're kind of expected to know how to do everything, and and I, I deeply don't. And I have a lot of help from the cellist, but you sort of, I have a sort of veneer of knowledge of all sorts of styles of music, and I, I can't write everything. And I always tend to veer towards the minimalist and the beautiful. And Michael, at that time we work with Michael, he does tend not to want the sentimental, I think. And there is great beauty in Bizet's score, isn't there? Absolutely beautiful stuff. But you're not as conscious of it in this No, in and this I sort play. of darkened I do uh, like it to be dark. Yeah, and to be honest, it's like nothing else you've ever seen. I think it's a fantastic job. We've done it. The, the music is really exciting, really exciting. Because you never know how to do it until you've sort of done it. And then you... You go on instinct, don't you, really? I think you go on instinct. Mm-hmm. 